So 25 years ago, someone took a really unfortunate picture. That's me on the left, <laughs> and my good friend on the right. And maybe when he sees this video, he might not be my good friend anymore. Um, this is at a time when I'm seriously just an awkward, shy, preteen kid with no clue. And it was at this point in my life when I woke up one morning and my parents tell me, son, you're going to art school. So I'm suddenly forced into a brand new school, into a brand new class of 30 girls, which was absolutely terrifying. And, <laughs> and my exams consist of me singing or dancing in front of the class, or worse, in front of the entire school. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I realized why this experience was so important and formative for me. First, in art school, I discovered a real fascination and love for the natural world. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it was in art school where I realized, you know, I'm only ever a moment away from epic embarrassment and failure. <laughs> and what you discover is how to learn from failure. So you wind up being out on a limb almost all of the time, and what happens is you get very comfortable being there. Okay, so this is why I believe that an arts education is so important for our young children today. Now, I want to actually just fast forward almost 20 years. I've just finished traveling around the world, training as a scientist. I find myself in Ottawa. I'm 29. I'm a new professor, and it's suddenly my job to start a research lab and become a world-leading expert in a particular area of research. Now, I want you to remember who you're dealing with. Deep down, I'm still that shy, awkward, preteen kid with absolutely no clue, except now, I really like taking risks, calculated risks, and I really like unconventional ideas. So I didn't tell anybody, especially the people offering me a job, I had no intention of becoming and le world-leading expert in anything. Instead, I had a hypothesis. If I filled my lab with artists, scientists, engineers, social scientists, designers, architects, and gave them freedom to fail and to take risks, and gave them the resources to do so, they would discover amazing things and ultimately do really cool stuff. So, this was actually pretty risky at the time, because in about five years from, now, from then, I would be expected to apply for my tenure and promotion. And if I wasn't a world-leading expert in a particular area of research, I would probably lose my job. And in fact, at the time, I'd pretty much decided, I, I'm, you know what, I'm going to lose my job. So <laughs> I'm just going to take the chance. I'm going to conduct the experiment and just see what happens. And eight years later, here I am. So I'm just going to take a moment now to show you a few of the things we've done, just to give you a sense of what we're up to. We've been able to watch a single healthy cell transform into a cancerous cell and grow into a microtumor that you can see here in green. We've started to understand the physical forces that shape how stem cells organize into tissues that resemble an early embryo. We've grown living, light-emitting skins on Lego minifigures. And we've even figured out how to use fruits, vegetables, and flower petals to create ultra-low-cost materials that might be usable as materials to repair our broken bodies. We've shown our work in art galleries in Ottawa and around the world, and we love to participate in Maker Faire. And this image is actually really remarkable. You've got a biochemist, a physicist, a painter, and an anthropologist all talking about the work they've been doing in our lab. And what's been truly humbling is that all of this work has been made possible through generous support and a remarkable amount of acclaim and awards that we've received in the last few years. Some of our devices have been collected by the Canada Science and Technology Museum because of their significance on the Canadian scientific landscape. There's a company uh, in Canada now commercializing, commercializing one of our inventions, and we even spun out our own mission-driven company that is developing open source hardware to promote biological research in regions around the world. So, <laughs> I've just brushed the tip 
of the iceberg of what these women and men have been able to achieve in only eight years. And I want to make a point here. We did this without a roadmap. We did this without milestones. And we certainly did this without a business plan. We're only successful because we gathered artists and scientists together as a community into the lab and capitalized on that diversity of knowledge and expertise and experience. But here is the key idea. When we identify an idea worth investigating, we employ the tradition of apprenticeship. Senior investigators train junior investigators in how to form a hypothesis, how to construct experiments, how to analyze and critically think about data, and how to use the tradecraft of science. By passing down this ancient knowledge through hands-on experimentation, we can amplify ideas through this potent mixture of craft, serendipity, and curiosity. So at this point, I want to give you a very concrete example of one of our projects and how it came to be. And I actually need a volunteer, and so I'm going to invite Craig. Craig is uh, modeling one of our inventions. This is an ultra-discreet, wearable piece of IoT technology. So why don't you give us a little twirl and maybe some action. You can see how this device is almost invisible. <laughs> Great job. So whenever you're ready, Craig, why don't you um, feel free to walk around the audience. You can show people. They can take a closer look at the device. So how many of you have seen these portable blood pressure monitors? They strap to your wrist. You put a, hit, uh, hit a button. The armband inflates, and the device reads out your blood pressure and your pulse. So I want you to keep that in mind. My team and I decided to go to a hackathon. This is a place where you go, you build something over three days, you compete, and at the end, you present your project, and you're judged. <laughs> so we pack up the car, we've got basic electronics, some, a 3D printer, some computers, and um, this blood pressure monitor. We show up at the hackathon, and we have no plan. We, like, literally, we have no idea what we're going to do, except that we want to use the blood pressure monitor. So that night, we sat down, <laughs> took it apart, pressure is on, uh, we figure out how this thing works, um, and, uh, well, Craig, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, go have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> this was unscripted. Uh, <laughs> we take this thing apart, we figure out how it works, and then we hook it up to the internet, and we gave it a Twitter account, and we discovered if we send this thing messages with a very specific hashtag, the armband will inflate, and it'll start squeezing the arm of whoever's wearing it. So what this means is that you could send Craig a hug over Twitter. What we had invented was a hug bot. And, <laughs> and amazingly enough, after goofing around for a couple of days, we won an award for this prototype. <laughs> now, I know this project sounds a little bit silly and like it's a complete waste of time. <laughs> but let's unpack it a little bit. My team, we showed up. No plan in place, none whatsoever. We came up, we invented a really crazy idea. We examined it, we analyzed it and we realized it in three days, and we walked away with an award. This is exactly what my lab is really good at doing. We are experts in that sort of creative process. So over the last few months, I've been really reflecting pretty deeply about where my lab has been, where it is now, and really, where are we going next? And like most universities, <laughs> The lab is in a building that's pretty intimidating, it's hard to find, and it's very hard to navigate. And this can be a real problem, because we thrive on working with people and communities that you don't normally find on a university campus. So I've had another idea. <laughs> and I have to admit, it's a little bit out there, but I'm pretty excited by it, so I'm going to share it with you today. This is Factory, and it's my next big risk. 
I want you to imagine what would happen if I took my lab from a university basement and I put it on the street in the busiest, most pedestrian, most touristy part of Ottawa. What would happen if I put my lab in a place where there was a physical connection and relationship with the community? I want you to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's really awesome. I want you to imagine a place that's literally full of people who have been trained through apprenticeship to be able to identify risky but worthwhile ideas, and they have the tools and techniques to be able to translate those ideas into tangible outcomes. Outcomes in medicine, in science, in art, in music, in design, in fashion, in architecture, in whatever. I want you to imagine how a place like this could impact our community right here at home. So, factory, this is the idea that I believe is worth spreading because its success will depend completely on the community. Now, I have to be <laughs> really honest. Remember, I'm an awkward, shy preteen kid with literally no clue, and I'm still that kid. But, you know, deep down, me and the few people that have started working with me on this, we don't really know how this is going to operate. <laughs> we don't really know what Factory is going to do. But I do know this, and I know it because I've already done it once before. If you put a community of creative and curious people together in a room and you give them resources and the freedom to take those risks and to fail, they will accomplish amazing things. I envision a place where somebody's walking down the street with their kids on a Saturday morning, and they can pop in and see what we're doing at any moment. And better yet, they could participate in the research process. I envision a place where the community, where you, where your ideas can be examined and explored, where your ideas can be amplified through that potent mixture of craft, serendipity, and curiosity that is now happening right on the street. So tonight, I'm actually here to invite every single person in this room to help us, in whatever way you can, to make Factory a reality in our city and in our community. Thank you.